Melissa, do I have your go ahead? Sure, go ahead. Welcome everyone uh, to the third webinar on the topic of environmental justice and environmental racism organized by the British Columbia chapter of the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment or CAPE BC. My name is Margaret McGregor and I'm the CAPE member and I'm zooming in today on the traditional and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. My co-chair is Austin Heffernan, and I'm going to ask him to introduce himself and briefly describe the question and answer process, and then we'll continue on with the meeting. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Austin Heffernan. I'm a third, uh, second year UBC medical student, uh, Kate member as well as a member of UBC EnviroMed. And I'll be co-moderating today uh, with Margaret. So just to give a quick introduction for the Q&A period, which will be happening um, after each individual's talk, um, we're gonna be using either the chat function, the Q&A function, um, or if you feel more comfortable, you can post it in the Slido link, uh, which has been uh, linked. There's a link placed in the chat. And please use the code and um, upvote the questions that uh, you find most resonate with you. Thank you, Austin. So the goal of the meeting today is really to learn about the link between Indigenous and environmental justice. And we're lucky to have two very powerful speakers on this topic. First, who will be up is Slato Molly Wickham, and next, Elder Francois Paulette, will share their insights. And after each talk, uh, we'll have a question and answer period. So think about the questions you have. But before starting, I would like to invite Elder Francois Paulette to do a smudge and prayer to open our meeting. And please know that we'll be giving Elder Paulette's impressive bio just before his talk. So for now, over to Francois for his smudge. Thank you, Francois. Uh, thank you. I uh, I have sage uh, burning here. I'm just going to welcome you all to this to this webinar talk on uh, the environment, rights, climate change, and. Uh, there are great changes to our balance to Mother Earth. And most of the time, and the biggest impacts that is made by, by man. So I'm just going to say a prayer in my own language. And I think uh, I want all of you that are on the call just to Think in the best way and pray in the best way that you know how. I know she but I thought she chat you. Hey, could I have a zoom or show a lot in her and her pal? I don't have a target, I don't see. But I already can see. I retire you, nor to you, nor new, nor to you, okay, so long, and I did have to know the skit. The house can't have seen or can't eat till the city, but on me. A deep night, can see, pause, you have to not turn it in or a skit. And I don't see a see a kid as all must see nor see. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Elder Paulette. Um, it helps to shed the set our shared intention in coming together this evening. So thank you, really appreciate it. I am now going to introduce our first speaker, Slato Molly Wickham. Slato, where are you? Can you turn on your camera. Are you there? Yay. Um, Slato is a spokesperson for the Gatimdan Checkpoint on Wet'suwet'en territory. She holds the name Kazik, 
which means grizzly house, and has been living on and occupying the territory since 2014 with her husband and children. Gatimdan Checkpoint has been an indigenous reoccupation site since 2018 and has been raided twice by militarized RCMP. Once in January 2019 and again on February 5th, 2020, as a result of grassroots resistance to the coastal gas link pipeline project, which would bring fracked gas to the northeast, from northeastern BC to an LNG terminal near Kitimat. Slato has her master's degree in Indigenous governance from the University of Victoria and is heavily involved in the Wet'suwet'en clan governance system. Welcome Slato and over to you. Hadi sai Slato Sydney getim den hasle Wet'suwet'enist in uh Francois Masai no Disney and Cape Masai no Disney uh so this been mistake uh, my name is Molly Wickham. I hold the name Slado in Cassia House, which is Grizzly Bear House, as um, Margaret had introduced me. Thank you so much for uh, the prayer, for opening us in a good way, and for inviting me to talk about um, to talk about issues today. And I apologize that I am not as prepared as as I would like to be, or like as I normally am. Um, we've been dealing with some a few deaths in our community um just over the past few days and so it's been it's taken a real toll on on all of us here i live on Pludispin, which is our territory in cassia grizzly house um it's currently a uh, front line uh in resistance to the coastal gasoline pipeline and we're experiencing um a lot of turmoil and fallout from colonization but also from this pipeline project that our hereditary chiefs have all um, stood up in our feast hall and um, and denied consent for this project to go go forward. Um, and there are a number of reasons why we've done that. And I think that the experiences that we've had this week as a nation and as communities really speaks to the fact that um, that this environmental racism that's happening, that the uh, impacts on our territories that are happening from projects like Coastal Gas Link, but from other industrial projects that go ahead um, and push through without consent of the Indigenous people, um, has a real life impacts on the ground day to day for our people, for our health, um, for our wellness. And it it's because all of our, it's because our health and our wellness are deeply, deeply tied to our land. And so we've had these losses over the over the last um, few months and over the last few days that have really impacted us. And it really speaks to the fact that as Indigenous people, we rely heavily on the land for our healing, for our health, for our mental wellness, for our spiritual wellness. Um, and because of projects like this and because of colonization and environmental racism, um, there, are, there are impacts that, that most couldn't or wouldn't understand unless they actually, um, you know, spend a day out in, in Gidimden territory here. Um, to, to give you an idea, we, we wake up in the morning to at least four or five helicopters that fly over um, our, settle, our occupation site before nine o'clock a.m. Um, we have RCMP and private security forces that um, surveil us and our children and our family and our community members um, daily. And that, um, you know, put our people at a huge risk of um, the stress that comes with having an industrial project like this being pushed onto us, the stress of the threats um by rcmp and the threats by this company to be forcefully removed from our territory um the threat of being separated from our family from our community from our land from our children um and put in jail because we are upholding our laws as indigenous people because we are upholding our responsibility to all of our relatives to our um you know, to the winged relatives, to the four leggeds, to everything. You know, we describe our territory as our yinta, and yinta means uh, every the land and everything 
that relies on the land, everything that is interconnected with the land, the air, the water, the animals, the insects, the humans, um, that's all part of our yinta. And it's under Wet'suwet'en law, it's our responsibility to protect our yinta for the future generations, that we are caretakers of this territory. And so when we see threats like this and we're having to deal with this, um, the fallout from that and the, and the security, the harassment, you know, on a daily basis for the last two years, um, over two years, you know, it really takes a toll on our health. It takes a toll on our well-being. It takes a toll on us spiritually. Um, and this is not this is not a new thing to Indigenous people. This is not uh, a new concept. It's not a new idea. It's not uh, something that we haven't dealt with before since the time of contact. Um, you know, Western society has accepted the fact that it's okay to. Um, do business as usual on Indigenous land. Um, and they've accepted that fact on the premise that Indigenous people don't own the land. And that that premise is deeply rooted in racism, in the racist ideology that we didn't have as Wet'suwet'en people, that we didn't have a governance system, that we didn't have, uh, that we didn't have ways to take care of ourselves, that we didn't have ways to manage our territories and our lands. Um, and so they were up for the taking, that they were empty, they were not being used, that we were savages and not human enough to deserve the same rights as other human beings. And so when we see projects like this happening, um, it's an extension of that very early um, form of racism, um, because today still the governments don't recognize us as a sovereign nation. They don't recognize that we have um, our own laws. And Western laws are definitely, you know, seen as superior to Wet'suwet'en law. And, you know, and a prime example of that is when the police come and raid our occupation sites, our communities out here on the territory, um, and they feel justified in doing that. And they call it their rule of law. And that presumes and assumes that Western law is the rule of law, that indigenous law and that Wet'suwet'en law um, don't have, that they're not rational, that we don't have um, any legitimacy. And so the fallout of that in terms of our health and our wellness is that our people can no longer go to our land to heal. Um, when there's helicopters flying over your territories um, back and forth on a daily basis, when the RCMP come to you and harass you and threaten you with arrest when you're doing your ceremonies on your territory, um, you cannot go to your territory to heal. The one place that used to be uh, a refuge to us to go to, to um, try and heal the wounds of colonization, to try to um, carry out our ceremonies. Um, for those that still know those pieces and that know the land intimately, we cannot carry through with those pieces of us, those pieces of our identity. And, and that is, uh, is very tragic for our people because we've already experienced so many policies and so many attempts to annihilate our spirituality, our, our practices, to annihilate our governance systems. And so this is one more attack um, that's being accepted by government, that's accepted by law enforcement you know, so-called law enforcement in, in British Columbia, um, in Canada, and that's being accepted by many people in society. And so it's very, very important that people understand how intimately connected we are to our territories and why we're doing what we're doing. Um, one of the main reasons that the hereditary chiefs of the Wet'suwet'en declined consent to this project is because of the man camps. Um, there are man camps all along the coastal gas link pipeline route that are being developed and that are being occupied right now. Um, we have one on Gedimden territory. There's another one in our neighboring territory, you know, about 
that are probably, you know, maybe 60, 40, 40 kilometers away from each other. Um, all along the route, there will be man camps deep, deep into the heart of Wet'suwet'en territory, um, places where there have not been people since our ancestors walked the trails over the mountains, um, places where there are ancient sacred burial grounds where, where our ancestors were buried along the Quis War Trail um, when they went to war with the Kitimat people. And there will be huge encampments of people, of men, mostly men coming into our communities and creating a huge risk to our Indigenous women. Uh, we live along a highway called the Highway of Tears. Um, and it's called the Highway of Tears because for generations now in my lifetime and my mother's lifetime and my grandmother's lifetime, our women have been going missing and found murdered along this highway through Wet'suwet'en territory. Um, the same highway, the same route that the um, coastal gassing pipeline is trying to create and putting these man camps in. Already we've seen uh, a significant number of our women being harassed, um, being sexually assaulted, being targeted, being hunted down by these men that come in from um, sometimes different countries, sometimes different provinces, um, and there's no consequence to their actions. Um, you know, we just went to court and we've tried so many different avenues of resistance to this project to because of the impacts that it will have on our community, not only the environment, but the health and well being of our community members. Um, and one of the one of the arguments was that they coastal gas Inc. did not consider the um, inquiry into murdered and missing indigenous women and the report and the re recommendations that came out of that inquiry. Um, and so we have to look at these impacts of what this is doing to our people. We have to be able to look at the consequences um, that are happening. And I think that putting pressure on the provincial government, putting pressure on the company, um, putting pressure on the province to place restrictions um, on these on these companies for the man camps, for their involvement in the spread of COVID-19 um, and for the impacts that it has on us spiritually and culturally on our territories that we can no longer access them. And so I encourage everybody to try to learn more about what's happening here in Wet'suwet'en territory because the fight is definitely not over. We've been here for two years. unistoten has been there for 10 years. Um, we're not going anywhere. We know that our survival depends on this project and other projects like it not going through. So thank you so much for um, listening to me today. And I'm looking forward to hearing um, more from Francois and answering any questions you have. Alexa, Ms. Seif. Thank you so much, Slato, for your presentation. Um, before starting the question and answer period, uh, I'd like to invite listeners to make a donation to Wet'suwet'en Nation efforts. And Molly has sent us a couple of links that I'm hoping Melissa will post. Uh, yeah, they're on the chat right now. So I encourage the listeners to, uh, to dig into their pockets and uh, contribute to uh, the fantastic efforts of uh, Wet'suwet'en Nation. To, to resist colonization and in particular, the, um, this uh, coastal gas link pipeline project. So um, I'm just looking in the question and answer section and I don't see any questions right now. However, I'd like to ask a question to Molly, which is uh, whether you can share with us some of your insights and experiences around the successes of uh, the nation in, in the resistance movement, because really um, Wet'suwet'en has been a beacon, not just in BC, but across the country for a number of years now. And um, there seems to be lots of very um, hard, but also joyful things, including something called the Healing Center. So I'm hoping you can kind of Give your thoughts on on successes of of the struggle and like you say you're 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 strong yeah. 
Thanks. Yes. Um, sometimes we get caught so caught up in the um, all the bad things that happen. And and I said to somebody one day, I'm like, I'm so sick of talking about all the horrible things that happen to me every day or that happen to us every day. Um, so thank you for asking that question. Um, we've had huge success in reoccupying our territories. Um, one of our things, one of our main uh, beliefs is that, you know, we we're stronger when we're on our territory. We're stronger when we are living on our territory, living um, the way that we were, uh, our ancestors lived um, is, and following their teachings and the laws. Um, we have our occupation site at Gidim Den Checkpoint. Um, over the past year, we've created We've uh, occupied another site that's very close to us that was an old ancestral um, village site that we shared and invited the Gixan to come and harvest with us um, at Lamprey Creek. And now we have three tiny houses there that um, by the end of the month will be fully solarized and off grid um, and for our community members to come and stay and be on the territory with us, but not directly in on the front line. Um, Udistotin has created a multi-million dollar uh, healing center. And so they have families that come to the healing center and spend time out on the territory. And this speaks so this speaks volumes to the way that our people healed on the land. Um, they don't have a lot of infrastructure set up in terms of, uh, you know, daily counseling appointments or drug and alcohol counselors. But I've seen families go through the healing center and I've seen individuals go through the healing center that have struggled with addiction, that have struggled with um, mental health their whole lives and have come out the other side um, extremely healthy, um, strong, spirited, and that today are still thriving as Indigenous people, um, as Wet'suwet'en people. And, you know, those things, you know, you can't, it's hard to quantify, to quantify those, but to know those people and to know the, the work that they've done and the way that the land has supported them is amazing. We have another clan, like Samisu, that also created a village on an old village site. Um, many of our old village sites were um, occupied by forestry and that were um, created and made into campsites by uh, the Ministry of Forests. And so we're, uh, Wet'suwet'en have been very successful in reclaiming those sites as our own and to build infrastructure on those sites. And so now we have three villages out in the territories, you know, an hour out of on logging roads out uh, from in the nearest towns and communities. And these villages are thriving with people, um, with new infrastructure, with new homes for people to live in. And so um, we strongly believe that this is how we are going to win this fight, that we need to know our land intimately. We need to be able to monitor our land intimately. And we are stronger as individuals and as a nation when we're on our land. And so um, I'm really proud of all of the work that everybody's done and all of the people that have supported us to do that work. I think you're muted, Margaret. We're getting a few questions coming in now. Um, one asks, uh, thank you for this presentation. Uh, Slato, how, and it's from John Price, how are the head of hereditary chiefs working through the issue of governance with band councils? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, there's, the band council system has been in place for, um, you know, a lot, a very long time for generations, but it's not our traditional system. And so um, a lot of the people who are in, um, you know, in positions of power within the band council systems are also members, all of the people that are in the band council systems are also members of our clan system. And so our clan governance system um, is the law that we follow and the system that we follow. And that's uh, the duty and responsibility of the hereditary chiefs to ensure that that system survives. And so the hereditary chiefs have been um, working with 
their clan members, trying to be inclusive of the bands in the um, MOU talks that were happening um, after the raid that happened last year. Um, and in those kinds of discussions, because the band councils have, they only have jurisdiction over the reserve. And that's what they were designed for, was to be a municipal government of sorts over the reserved lands. And so a lot of the work that they have to do is to ensure that the roads are safe, look at housing on the reserve and those kinds of other, um, those types of other work. But the, the work that happens uh, in regards to what does or does not happen on the territory and the management of all of the lands on the territory, that belongs to the clans and to the clan chiefs um, to, to engage in their, uh, their clan governance decision-making processes. And so, of course, the ban councils were put in place to undermine our hereditary system, and the chiefs have been very clear that they don't want to be in conflict with any of the ban councils. The ban councils are there um, to do a job. They they're responsible for taking care of the reserve communities and that that's an important thing for them to do. Um, and so they've been trying to work with the band councils in how we're going to move forward from this, because um, we know that it's not our people that are trying to create divide and trying to create conflict within our communities. We know that um, you know, there's oftentimes, you know, persuading um, bribery and sometimes outright extortion of banned communities and the banned councils um, in dealings such as Coastal Gas Link. Thank you. There's another question here. Slado, could you tell us more about the connection between land and Indigenous health and some examples of how health professionals can support it? Sure. So one of the things that that I believe is true is that all of our everything about us as Indigenous people comes from our land. Our, our language comes from our land. Our songs come from our land. Our um, our medicines come from the land. And so I think that it's very important for us to physically just be on the land. Um, but also to have access to our medicines, to have access to the knowledge about our, our medicines and our foods and all of the things, the way that we lived our lives that made us healthy people, that made us strong people. And I think that, you know, there's a number of ways that healthcare professionals can support that connection to land. Um, I mean, we can't assume that everybody has that knowledge because of colonization and the impacts um, and the policies that have been put in place. But for people that do have that connection or finding places like the healing center that, you know, people could go to um, that are land based. Um, looking at uh, taking into account a trauma lens in, in how we're interacting with people, indigenous people that have experienced um, the fallout of colonization, um, even just things like um, acknowledging and recognizing the medicines that we take. You know, oftentimes I've gone into a, a you know, into a doctor's appointment with something wrong and, and talk, tried to talk about, you know, something that I was going to take. And if there's no knowledge of that, um, sometimes it can be seen as uh, inferior to Western medicine. Sometimes it can be seen as um, dangerous if people don't know uh, or aren't comfortable with how it's used. Um, and so that sometimes prevents Indigenous people from feeling like they want to bring it up or feeling like they are okay to go and access those medicines or to use them. Um, one particular case is, you know, my mom struggled with breast cancer and we have a lot of Indigenous medicines that, uh, that she could take and that she would take, but was advised not to take um, because there, there was just wasn't enough information about those medicines. So I feel like um, really encouraging people um, on a day-to-day -day basis, but also creating space within the healthcare system for Indigenous knowledges and Indigenous practices. Um, you know, I think probably other places are a lot, a lot better at doing that. Here in the North, 
of Northern BC and our rural communities, um, we experience a lot of racism in the healthcare system. Um, people don't feel comfortable to go to uh, healthcare practitioners often, um, let alone to talk about our practices and what we might feel good about doing for our own health. Thank you. So essentially decolonizing the healthcare system is a, is a good task. Um, uh, the other thing just more directly is going back to the link and providing some financial support, all healthcare professionals, you know, they, they can, uh, you know, may, maybe make a donation on that regard as well. Um, so this last question is what are the most impactful ways for healthcare professionals to act as allies? And I feel like you kind of answered that already, but if you have any other um, tidbits you'd like to throw in there, um, we'll make that the last question. Great, thanks. I think that including Indigenous voices and is a, is a great start um, in the health uh, discussion and our you know, one of the biggest things that we've been struggling with lately is, co is uh, the COVID pandemic. Obviously, everybody has been struggling with that. In our territory, um, we're really struggling with the man camps and the fact that uh, this project in particular is, is considered an essential service. Um, we have all kinds of workers coming into our communities and spreading COVID. Um, in December, we had three elders, language speakers that died within one month. Um, directly linked to CGL workers. Um, we, we did have some great support around um, letters to Bonnie Henry and open letters to around um, putting some restrictions on the Coastal Gas Link project in terms of COVID-19. Um, we're still experiencing that we have RCMP that come into the communities from all over the province. They don't come from here and they come in and out every week and they're allowed to travel. They're allowed to bring, come from the lower mainland into our communities and put our people at risk of contracting the virus. Um, I think that putting pressure on, on the province on within the healthcare system, um, within the northern region, um, the uh, the northern health region is really important, and they're not, you know, people aren't listening to us, um, but I think that they will listen to um, other healthcare practitioners like yourselves. So, thank you. Thank you for for those suggestions. Uh, I'm now going to, and there, for the audience, there will be lots more opportunity at the end uh, of the session to ask questions to both speakers, but over to Austin now to uh, introduce Elder Francois. Thanks, Margaret, and thanks, Slato. It was a really, really great presentation. I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot. Um, so our next uh, speaker is Elder Francois Poulet, who is a Denis Sonne and member of the Smith's Landing Treaty 8 First Nation, Francois Poulet survived the residential school system before going on to become the youngest chief in the Northwest Territory Indian Brotherhood in 1971. In 1972, along with 16 other chiefs from the Mackenzie Valley, he challenged the Crown to recognize treaty rights and Aboriginal titles to over 450,000 square miles of land in the historic Paulette case. Francois remains active in efforts to protect the natural environment of Dene Dene, he has contributed to numerous water conferences in the North and has been a collaborator on several documentaries focusing on the impact of the tar sands development on the environment and peoples of Northern Canada. Over a period of nine years, he participated in annual meetings of the United Nations COP on climate change and contributed to the Indigenous people's traditional knowledge articles of the Paris Agreement. He was recently named an officer of the Order of Canada and is an adjunct professor at the School of Public Health at the University of Alberta. His well-being and strength continue to derive from his relationships with his family and the ancestral lands of the Dene Sone. And I would like to warmly welcome Francois to this presentation. Uh, Salotina. This word is uh, I'm just saying all my relations. I am thankful. Uh, to be here this evening to speak about a life long before what a beautiful territory lands that we had. 
I just want to say that uh, before Columbus came here, that our people, there was no sickness, there was no cancer, no diseases that killed off people. And how do they know this? People, archeologists that you dig up bones and you find that there is before contact, there was no, no sickness. I wanted just to say that. I think it's important that, uh, that this talk is around who I am. I am a Denison Finna. I uh, I am always talking about my Denichania. My Denichania is very descriptive of who I am as a human being. I come from a matriarch system. My wife is a midwife. She plays a major role in the community. I'm a servant to Mother Earth. I'm also a servant to the womankind. To understand Mother Earth from the day I was brought into this world, living in a bush, living on the land, gave me a lot of strength because my Dinachanya gave me my spiritual laws my environmental laws, my emotional, my mental well-being, and of course, the physical. These laws transcended through time and it's changed to some degree because of colonization, assimilation, And it's, I just want to share a story. Over 300 years ago, the English people arrived on this part of the world at the Hudson Bay. They were after one thing, and that was fur. The English people and the Hudson Bay colonized our people. I think our people at the time didn't really know the extent of what damage that they were doing to the animals, taking thousands and thousands of animals. And today we are suffering because of that. <clears throat> but there was a famous leader, a leader that existed that day. His name was Matanabe. Matanabe had a huge following, had a huge army. <clears throat> and he sided with the English. And during the seven year war between France, be between France and the English, the French took over the fort, Fort Prince of Wales on the Hudson Bay that our people built with the English. When this fort was taken over by the English people, by, I mean by the French people, Matanabe's tribe, his warriors were not there to defend the fort. And Mat Matanabe had a huge monopoly on, on the fur the coming and going of the fur. This takeover by the French devastated him. At a very young age, Matanabe takes his own life. This is the first recorded suicide 
amongst our people. And to this day, the, the suicides are skyrocketed. And our then laws that that we had followed our people and all the traditional teachings that we carried with that. And these were very, very, very straightforward laws, respect, humility. Everyone, I think, harnessed that belief system, humility, wisdom, love. And this domination of the Europeans since they stepped foot on North America before Columbus, their number one intent was to colonize, to assimilate, to Christianize and take away our lands, that we were subhuman to them. And our people slowly turned their backs on their laws. I'm not saying all of them. And the young lady that spoke before me mentioned the Indian Act of 1867, that was a racist, racist policy, racist law. Their whole intent was racist to dominate us. Here in the North, where I live and Treaty 8 and Treaty 11, Oil was struck in Norman Wells. And that's when Treaty 11 was made. That is a hundred years ago. Fossil fuel today <clears throat> does more damage <clears throat> than, un than any other resource that I know of. The tar sands are just south of me, about 160 miles upriver, has impacted our people. We have done research, we have done films. Even one time we brought in uh, James Cameron to come and support us. I brought him in. Lord of Impact, Bishop Tutu from South Africa. A lot of people have come in to support us. But unfortunately, that tar sands is still moving, is still going. The tar sands has damaged our river system. <clears throat> has damaged the fish population. About 10 years ago or so, the people of Fort Ship were told that they cannot eat the fish anymore. And they were also told that they couldn't swim in the water. Their children couldn't move in there, that they were forced not to eat the fish, they were forced not to eat the moose. My backyard is the Wood Buffalo National Park. All of my life, I've known Buffalo. And we were told not to eat Buffalo in that part of the world also. This, this impact, not just the humankind, but it impact everything. Because everything for us is alive. Everything is living, water, 
it's a life it has a spirit it has a heart it has a mind it has a body the buffalo the four-legged the wingets the birds everything they have their place the swimmers and the creepers yeah everything is caring they respect they're accepting that's how I grew up. But residential school, to some degree, really tried their hardest. I was stolen from my family when I was six years old. After three years or so, I ran away from that place, never looked back. I will say one thing about the Ten Commandments. Christianity, the, the Bible, the Ten Commandments, it has one, uh, I have always forced to read that. It says, thou shall not steal. At a young age, I was thinking, wow, these people stole me from my family they are trying to take my language and I never went beyond that thou shall not steal. I don't know what's after that. Anyway, that's not important. What's important uh, is I knew what those people were up to. Rights. And I was mentioned domination the doctrine of discovery, the whole process of policy is all based on domination. It's right to this day. Every aspect, the RCMP, the RCMP traditionally that came into our country, that was not their business to interfere with our life. That's what the treaty says. And he didn't do that. I'm appalled that the prime minister stands by and he allows the RCMP to go into a territory of Mali. That is appalling. Do you see under cap, they have this buffalo, this button majestic buffalo head. This majestic buffalo head is, is a huge symbol to us. But they dishonor that. So rights, the Paulette case, when we filed the Paulette case in 72, we won the, the we won the case that we had prior interest in over four hundred and fifty thousand square square miles of land, including the Nishka case that won the same the same kind of court case in nineteen seventy three. These two cases propelled our people that we had rights to lands, our language, our history. It was quite uh, quite the time. The Berger inquiry. Mr. Berger that comes from Bridges, Columbia, he passed away not too long ago. I was asked to talk about him. And he did hearings for two years. At the end of these two years, he uh, his recommendation that there be no pipeline built after all the land claim settlements are over. And to this day, the pipeline is not built. And I'm very happy. I don't need the pipeline. We don't need the pipeline. We don't need the gas. We don't need the oil. I just want to say one thing here, 1977, I was a young chief and there was a delegation of us from Canada to stay, you know, the Native Americans 
South America, we went to Geneva. This travel to Geneva, we were seeking a seat at the United Nations. We were seeking a seat at the UN. But somehow, they didn't want to give us a seat. And this is where UNDRIP came in. If you can understand that history, I'm pretty familiar with it. But they don't even follow UNDRIP. Canada here was the biggest obstacle in writing UNDRIP. It's a, this fossil fuel is in every aspect of, in our homes. It's, The electricity, the power that comes from our lands, we have plastic, we have gasoline, we have NAMPA, we are really struggling at this time with fossil fuel. There are a lot of countries, third world countries as we call them, are opposed to that. I've been to nine climate change summits. Lots of people go there. Some places, 40,000 people. Just think about that, 40,000 people. To adopt a resolution at that summit. They wanted to go to 1.5 degree. All it needs one country not to support that. One country, the last COP meeting I was, I was there speaking at the same time here in the Newvik, talking about 1.5, it was 3.5 degrees warmer in Anuvik, that's the Arctic Ocean. But the countries that opposed were the UN, I mean the United States, Saudi Arabia, these big, big time fossil fuel people. And I remember the, the Saudi Arabia stood up and I spoke after them. You know, I was kind of very disappointed in them. But, the, but that's the way the rule is. And I said then, if you people that come here that want to do some work in this climate crisis we're in, in this world. You people that support fossil fuel, stay home. Stay home, let the people that want to make changes to the climate be here at this meeting. So, UNDRIP, COP, climate change, they have introduced policy 
to help indigenous peoples protocols of traditional knowledge, which is nice. Canada supports that, but they don't implement it. They don't implement it. Yeah, it sounds good. Yeah, they'll build a pipeline through through BC. They're talking about what in the world is Trudeau, his business in purchasing a pipeline. That is not his business. His business is to govern. Anyway, that's done. And I'm glad that the south of the border, that uh, the new administration there is backing off on building pipelines. And the north and the Alaska refuge of impacting the last refuge place of the caribou. Porcupine herd, they're backing off on that to do any drilling there. Yes, we are. There's a lot of contradictions. I have contradictions. Site C, the dam they want to build on the Peace River, the second dam. They don't need that. They don't need that energy to for housing, or for it to go in the states for anything. They're using that power. <clears throat> it's going to go to computers. I'm just starting to learn that like computers use up more power than this home here. Some people in the States are opposed to cell towers because cell towers are causing sickness. If people study I'm starting to learn about G3, G4. Now you look in the you look in the in the TV advertisement, G5. G5 is going to use more energy, more energy. So, I. When I think about that, yeah, Site C is going to do more damage. So I encourage the people, my, my First Nation, that these cell towers should not be built on our territory if they were to do that. So I have a I have many things that are out there. One of them I want to say is reconciliation. Wow. Reconciliation, what a fancy big word. But those guys just a word, a talk. You know, in my language, in my language when we do harm to somebody and we make amends, we say, we say, non allier, non allier. What that means, it means, let's take down. Let's take down and start over. So if Canada is talking about reconciliation based on that, rather than their words of reconciling, then, there, then we have somewhere to go by. But now it's all 
about them. We're not the ones that were, we're not the ones that, we don't have to reconcile with Canada. What harm have we done them? I kind of try to figure that one out. What harm have we done to Canada? So when I, when I go there, one thing about we're introducing on the land programs. Right now, this week, we're having an online program, fish, fish camp. We're starting to do that. We're trying, to, we're working on empowering the young people, empowering them because they've been punished, they've been, us, they've been colonized, we got to get them out of that. And so that's a form of decolonizing to go back on the land to reintroduce our Dinajania, our way of life, Language, language is powerful. And Molly mentioned that. The one people that we can use to support this mental health issues because of climate change or fossil fuel, the mental health is on the rise. We have issues with our own people and it's on the rise. This is addiction, alcohol, drugs. And in the past, I've used the Canadian Medical Health Association. In the past, uh, here in the territories, I, I've used the doctors to uh, talk about the tar sands and the damage of the tar sands to our people. So we can, you know, we can use them. Lastly, I just want to say, we are people are being flooded as we talk. Fort, you know, Fort Simpson is underwater. The water is damaged, no electricity. There, we have, uh, we, they're evacuated to Fort Smith. Some are here, some are there, everywhere. They're displaced. And Jean Marie River. So all your rich people out there, you wanna make a donation to the Descho First Nation for the flood victims. And right now down the river, Mackenzie, the people are bracing for floods to uh, Norman Wells, Good Hope, Eklavik, they're bracing for it, they're getting ready for it. It is climate change. We've had, we've had more snow this year down the Mackenzie Valley than we have ever had due to climate change. And climate change is caused by fossil fuel. Just think about it. Fort McMurray tar sands produces a third of the green gas emissions in Canada. So let's make a donation to those people. I think I should stop there. Somebody rang a bell on this side. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Elder Paulettes. That was a very engaging, being a very engaging talk, and we really appreciate uh, your knowledge um, and everything that you share with us today. Um, so I was going to provide a uh, little fundraising pitch for Fort Simpson, um, as well as Jean River, Jean Marie River, but um, Elder Paulette provided a very uh, eloquent uh, fundraising pitch. So the link for the fundraiser is in the chat. Um, so if you could, if you could please, uh, click the link, read a little bit more. And, and if that, uh, resonates with you, then please, 
uh, provides some monetary support for these communities as they're going through a lot right now. Um, so now we're gonna move on to the Q&A. So I'm just gonna pull up, um, there's a question from uh, Larry. I uh, said, Elder Paulette, you have described an incredibly close relationship of Indigenous people to the land. Do you have advice for non-Indigenous people as to how we can learn to appreciate the importance of the land like you do and help preserve our environment? Well, uh, I always encourage people to go to the land, to travel the river systems, to go to the back doors, go to the parks. You can go to these events that are taking place all over the country in the summer. There's a lot of uh, traditional activities are going on, dancing, powwows, hand games, yeah, and most of all is seeking out an elder that has the background or the pouch of tobacco and saying, and ask a direct question of what it is that you want to know. That's a good protocol way to do that. Thank you so much. Uh, so there's another question. Um, let me pull it up. So Elder Poulette, do you have any suggestions for how healthcare professionals can help increase support for indigenous and environmental justice? Uh, for the longest time I was, uh, I did work in the place of uh, human resources, cross-cultural training, intercultural training, professional training for doctors and nurses in a cross-cultural setting. And that works. And you have a, a one day, two day, or three day, or some of them were gone for a week for education, for educators, teachers. The police, uh, they kind of shy away from that. And I can understand that. But they need it. They need it more than ever. And uh, because we have to get away, go, we have to move away from this racist thinking, racist past, and uh, training on the land, cross cultural training is an effective tool to do that. Thank you. So the next three questions uh, that we have are directed at both uh, Elder Colette as well as Slato. Um, so we'll start with the first one. So these days, to what degree are you as a community able to practice using your medicines for health? Uh, I'll let the Elder go first, if he'd like to go first. Well, I, uh, I live out in the bush. I'm a recovering alcoholic. I haven't drank for 40, going on 47 years. I don't do drugs. I don't smoke cigarettes. And uh, I don't gamble. So I live a clean life. But more so, I pray a lot. I pray a lot. And uh, up here, I'm, I'm referred to as a traditional practitioner to help people that have either uh, physical sickness, mental ailment, and all of these things. So I am a resource here. And uh, I'm like a, I'm like a middleman. Anyway, I'll stop there. Uh, 
Yeah, so one of the reasons why um, we're fighting so hard to protect our Yinta is because we do access a lot of the territories for our medicines. And so we harvest a lot of medicines from the territory. There's a lot of really um, important medicine harvesting sites uh, along the pipeline route and within our territory in Gidimden. I know Unistoten, you know, they have had uh, last year, they had a elders medicine camp where all of uh, all of the elders came out and harvested medicines and made salves and made teas and instructed people how to use the medicines um it's something that we're i feel like we're pretty strong in within our nation that we do are able to utilize a lot of the territories because a lot of the territories are still um accessible and that's why it's so important to us that we don't lose that, that we still can go out and, and um, that we can go out without being harassed and intimidated by pipeline workers or RCMP, um, et cetera. So um, I feel like we do have a lot of that knowledge. Um, over the past couple of years, we've done medicine drives where we've asked people to um, indigenous uh, people who are making medicines um, to, for folks to donate um, to indigenous folks to send medicines to us. And so lots of indigenous owned companies that do medicine work um, that make salves or tinctures or things like that have sent us up uh, amazing care packages with tinctures um, for stress and anxiety and um, for our hearts and um, for salves for cuts and bruises and you know bug dope and all of the things um, that we might need to take care of ourselves because we don't on a front line, we don't have time. We don't have the time that we used to have to be able to go and harvest our own medicines. Um, and so ways that people have supported that is that people would send indigenous owned companies um, funds and donations, and then for them to send us medicines that we aren't able to access here. Outside. Well, thank you both so much for those, those uh, responses. Um, so we have a lot of questions coming in. Um, I think everything you guys have been saying has really sparked uh, a lot of questions from the audience. So there's another question to both of you. Um, if you could speak with any decision maker who can write the injustices being done in your territory, with whom would you speak and what would you say? Well, uh, as a chief, the best form of communication is you talk to the person one on one. When I was a chief, when I when I was an active chief, that's what I used to do: go into a bureaucrat's office and just talk to them in a nice way. That's how I did business. You could write a letter, a nice, nice written letter, and uh, we can come back to you. And then you can write another letter. And they say they're not moving well. And then you start talking about a lawyer. <laughs> that way, you kind of shy away from talking to your lawyer. So there's many forms, but the best way is I, I feel direct communication. Um, that's an interesting question. I, I, I don't feel like I would like to sit down with um, any of the people that probably have any sort of decision making power over the coastal gasoline pipeline. Um, but I do know that our hereditary chiefs have requested to have direct meetings with um, both um, with Justin Trudeau, um, as well as John Horgan. Um, and that that those requests have never been um, 
have never been honored. And I feel like that's very disrespectful. Um, I feel like we've also made a great effort to reach out to Dr. Bonnie Henry around the COVID situation and the health impacts on our community because of this project. Um, and that has never, that invitation has never received a response either. And so um, I feel like our chiefs are the same, you know, they have the same sentiment as the elder described. They want to sit down with the people who are making decisions because at our level in our governance system, our hereditary chiefs are the speakers for our clan. They're the ones that have the, um, they have the experience and the wagoose the respect to be able to sit down and have a real conversation with other leaders and they see uh people like justin trudeau or john horgan as the people that they should be talking to um they shouldn't be talking to um you know their assistants or the directors of certain ministries they should be talking to the decision makers and so those requests have yet to be honored um, from our hereditary chiefs well, we have um, a couple other questions that are very related to this um, so to both not everyone fights for their rights and the health of their people and the environment what was the turning point that made you start to take action Well, uh, when I was a young chief, uh, I was 21 year old. I come from, I'm a, come from a leadership uh, roles, responsibility. There was this pipeline, this Mackenzie gas pipeline that was to be built in our territory. And uh, so I was, because of my background with the treaties, my father was a chief, his father, I was up on, I was up to date on all of the issues that were before us, but this pipeline was a threat, a direct threat to our, our lands. So we filed uh, the caveat that those lands are ours. We never surrendered or extinguished our lands. So uh, 1973, uh, the court uh, ruled in our favor. So that, uh, that changed the direction of how business was to flow. But now the Berger inquiry did the inquiry and asking us if we wanted this pipeline at the end. We didn't want the pipeline, and so the pipeline was not built. Thank you, Francois. Uh, Slater, do you, would you like to add to that? Um, sure, I, I don't know if there was a, a distinct turning point for me. I think that um, once our hereditary chiefs decided that this that they would not provide consent for this project, um, that put a responsibility on all of us to take a stance um, to support them. Once it's decided in our bathlots in our governance hall, it becomes law. And so I feel like um, I feel a great responsibility to uphold our law, um, to uphold our system. And if we aren't following our laws, then our system will fail. Our system won't function. And so this is just as important a law as any of our laws. And I think that just growing up with this sense and, and experiencing and seeing all of the injustices in the world, um, you know, I have children of my own and I want them to experience a different world to grow up in. I want them to know the territory and to know their culture and know who they are and to not have to experience all the injustices um, that many of us have seen through our lifetimes. And so um, I feel it's a great responsibility of mine 
to raise my children knowing that they have to protect this land and that I'm doing everything that I can to protect it for them. Well, those turning points were very inspiring. Um, so we have a couple more questions, but just for the sake of time, I'm just gonna ask uh, this one. Uh, so to both of you, what have you found to be the most effective strategy to get people supporting and working with you? Images, films, letters, stories? Well, uh, <laughs> I've been kind of, I've been kind of uh, on the front lines all my life. Uh, the Paulette case, the Berger inquiry. <clears throat> but uh, because of where I live, I, I live out in the bush. And uh, before the pandemic, uh, I've been part of 11 documentaries, films. It's a good tool. And uh, right now, there is a film makers from Paris want to come here, but they can't come here. Uh, they got to come here to Canada, they got to quarantine 14 days, then they got to come up here north for 14 days. So dear, I just told them to back off on it till things get a little better on the travel. But I, uh, but I, but I figure that uh, for me, it's, uh, it's documentaries. Yeah, I think that I agree that social media and um, short films, short docs have been really helpful for us, for our movement. I also think that they've been very successful because we've had um, a lot of opportunity over the last 10 years of fighting this struggle um, to make real relationships with people face to face. I think that that's something that we are struggling with right now is being able to regularly update people. Um, you know, people, if people see something on social media, it's, it's impactful, it can be impactful, and it has been impactful, but it's not as impactful as if um, we've met those people face to face, and then they see what's happening to us. And then it, it inspires them to take action because they know who we are, they know that we're real people, they know how we live, they've been to our territories or we've been to their territories and having those relationships is really important for us. Um, I wish that we could do more of that right now. I wish that we could spend, you know, some of this time um, building more and more relationships. And I think that's why we saw such a huge response all, ac all across so-called Canada is because we have those relationships with other Indigenous nations and other organizations. And then when we put the call out, um, people want to respond because they know us and they know what we're about. And I think that that's a really powerful thing. Um, we also have that short doc invasion um, about the Witswatin struggle and the, there's a full uh, length uh, documentary being done and developed that um, should be ready by next year. Alexa. Well, we look forward to, to seeing that next year. And thank you both so much uh, for a very engaging, very impressive um, talk. I've learned a lot and uh, I'm sure the audience has learned a lot as well. Um, so that concludes our Q&A. And I'm sorry for those of you whose questions were not answered just for the sake of time. Um, we didn't have time to get to all of them, uh, but I'd like to thank the audience as well uh, for taking time out of their Saturday on this beautiful day to learning a lot uh, about this very important issue. And sorry for the sirens in the background, I live close to a busy street. Um, and just for all the medical students uh, that may be on the call, I just wanna put a quick little plug in for CFMS Heart, uh, which is a group within uh, the Canadian Federation of Medical Students that helps coordinate 
advocacy efforts among Canadian medical schools regarding current issues in environmental health and climate change. This is a great organization filled with great people. And if you're interested in advocating for the environment, it is a great way to get involved. And there's a link in the chat. Um, and I think Margaret would like to say a few words as well. Yeah, um, I wanna first thank our speakers from the bottom of my heart for really helping to educate us about these important topics. You know, as doctors were trained in medical school for a principle and that principle is do no harm. And I think uh, both of your words ha have given us a lot of um, uh, room to think about what this means as environmentalists honoring indigenous sovereignty. So I think uh, it's been, you've given, uh, you know, you've reviewed the importance of the whole medical system and uh, we're, we're learning more and more about how racism affects the system we work in. You've taught us a lot about the importance of the land and respecting the indigenous relationship to the land. And I can, I can, I really wanna thank you and, um, I hope that you will come again and uh, talk with us again. Um, I also want to thank CAPE staff, uh, Melissa Lem, Kevin Liang, Celia Walker, and Larry Barzilai for all their efforts in organizing today's meeting. And a recording of the session will be sent out along with a feedback survey. And we're really interested in what you have to say about these sessions both uh, how this one went, but also about future topics you'd like to, uh, to hear um, CAPE put on. And um, finally, I just wanna say that CAPE's actually been around for over 40 years. And uh, the main goal of CAPE is really to bring a health lens to environmental degradation, climate change, and other threats to planetary health. So, and we're campaigning at the moment uh, to strengthen something called the Canada Environmental Protection Act or CEPA. And if you wanna learn more about it or join or donate to CAPE, we have also put these links into the chat. And on that note, I'm going to end the meeting and really wish everyone a safe and restful weekend. And thank you again for your time and your, your words and um, we shall meet again. Take care, everybody.